In 1950, Argentina and Venezuela were two of the richest countries in the world, with a GDP per capita on par with Western Europe. How have they suffered such sharp economic decline since then? Venezuela was once the richest country in Latin America. It has the largest known oil reserves in the world, and its democratic government was once praised worldwide. But today, Venezuela's democratic institutions and its economy are in shambles. The country has the highest inflation in the world, making food and medicine inaccessible to most Venezuelans. Over the last four years, its GDP has fallen 35%, which is a sharper drop than the one seen during the Great Depression in the US. The country's murder rate has surpassed that of the most dangerous cities in the world. These conditions have sparked months of protests against the president, Nicolas Maduro. And it's easy to see why, the country has become measurably worse since his election in 2013. Today, Venezuela remains in the grip of a political and economic crisis. A year ago, opposition leader Juan Guaido claimed the presidency from Nicolas Maduro, who is accused of election fraud and dictatorial rule. Despite massive anti-government protests and more than 50 countries backing Guaido, Maduro has clung to power. Inflation, which can now be classified as hyperinflation, is one of Venezuela's biggest problems. Despite six increases in the minimum wage, workers are still taking home hundreds of thousands of bolivars, which are only the equivalent of a few US dollars every month. And Maduro has shown quite a lot of resilience. This resilience has a race on in the alliance with the military. So I think he can remain in power as long as this alliance with the military holds. Welcome to the Atlantis Report. The first time that Chavez won was legitimate. A lot of people wanted a change. He had been forgiven by the previous president, who let him out of jail after being imprisoned for attempting a military coup. But after his first term, many were unhappy. He was expropriating private, local, big and small businesses, then bringing them to ruins. He would also badmouth the US constantly. Many international companies were very uncertain about investing in the country and started removing their businesses. He had also threatened TV and radio channels, as well as newspapers with closing them, which he ended up doing to some in his next term. There were massive protests against him in which many protesters were shot. Several national ONGs started asking for international assistance to stop his totalitarian practices. His second term was a questionable win. He changed the constitution to be re-elected indefinitely and to extend his presidency time from five to six years. He took over the CNE, which counts the votes in all the elections. His support for narco-trafficking activities in Colombia, as well as his corrupted ways, were already well known. He was perpetuated in power even after the massive protests. The CNE lost its credibility. Many of the opposition, though, was very naive and continued to play the game of elections. National industries such as oil, power, water, transportation, communications, and construction were being neglected by the government, affecting their services to the public. Inflation kept on increasing, and Chavez continued deleting zeros from the Bolivar, the currency, thinking that it would make a difference. He had put the country into huge debt, and now it depends mostly on oil. And in the meantime, Chavez had brought Cubans to be part of every existing government institution in Venezuela. People from all classes were very upset because of the lack of basic services such as water and electricity, as well as the increasing inflation and insecurity. Express kidnappings became common. This was over 12 years ago. When Chavez learned of his sickness, he chose Maduro to be his successor. Many basic products were already scarce, such as milk, sugar, oil, flour, gas for cars and for cooking, and cement. Many in the opposition believed that Maduro was one of the shooters in the protests against Chávez. In 2013 he was put there by the CNE after many irregularities were reported, such as huge bags of ballots found in abandoned roads. Throughout all these years, protests continued to be massive. Ever since I can remember, there had been protests against Chávez and Maduro in Venezuela. Huge, massive, and constant. The worst ones I can remember were in 2014 and 2017 when civilians were bluntly shot by military and colectivos. The colectivos started with Chávez as community groups to help them organize and solve their issues together. But they were armed by the government and during every protest received the order from Maduro to contain the rebels by any means. Chávez and Maduro's motto is Patria, Socialismo o Muerte. 
Homeland, socialism, or death. The result of 20 years of protests has been thousands of political prisoners, as well as students, and regular civilians of all ages and social statuses, who have been put in jail or shot in daylight for opposing the government. Human Rights Watch has been following the situation for years, the same as the OEA. After Maduro took over, the situation went even more south. He had been left with a humongous debt, industries were collapsing, yet he continued expropriating private businesses, and getting into more debt. Promises made 20 years ago were long gone. The oil prices had decreased, which is normal because it follows a cycle, inflation continued to cripple, and basic products such as rice, meat, chicken, eggs, fruit, vegetables, butter, toilet paper, feminine care, medicines, personal care, among others mentioned previously, were very scarce or non-existent. Inflation had gone over 700%. Vendors stopped putting price marks on all their products, food, clothes, medicine, personal care, everything, because prices changed every day. This has been happening in the last six years. Power and water go out for days, so more businesses go under. A minimum wage is not enough to buy a dozen eggs. There is no public transportation. People have to walk 15 to 30 blocks to get to their jobs. Parts of cars are almost impossible to find and afford. Many don't drive their cars anymore because they cannot afford it, and this also affected the bus system. Protests have dwindled because over 5 million people, rich and poor, have left. The rich and middle classes take planes. The poor cross the Colombian or Brazilian borders after days of walking. Some venture to Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Argentina, with no money, barely a backpack. Colombia has been very supportive of creating refugee camps to give them food and shelter. People leave because there is no more sovereignty. If they protest, they get shot or tortured, and voting doesn't count. It's a charade put by the government to make believe the international community that they are democratic. But they bought these machines called Smartmatic and have been rigging the elections in the last 10 years. The CNE, which manages the elections, is run by the government, Tibise Lucina has run it since 2006. The methods of torture practiced by the Seben in El Helicoide, where they put all political prisoners, are horrid. They force them to mutilate each other, eat each other parts, and then kill each other. The colectivos drive by the neighborhoods of those who start the protests, from high, to middle and low income classes. They shoot whoever is walking on the street. They have entered homes to capture protesters, beat them up, kill them, or put them in jail. Most people that still live in Venezuela have quit their jobs because it's not worth it to work. Most of them survive by receiving dollars from family members abroad and selling crafts, such as bakery goods and spirits. They also used to do online surveys to earn pennies and a few dollars, but with the power gone every day, they can't even do that anymore. In the last 10 years, the government also created another control system. Only those who voted for Chavez could get El Carnet de la Patria, a political party ID to buy cheaper food. Before things got worse, the government also began requiring civilians to only purchase food on certain days, according to the last number of their regular ID. This was for everyone. After waiting hours in line outside the supermarket, risking your life because people would attack each other for a better spot, you would go and put your fingerprint to be allowed to enter the grocery store you were only allowed to buy one item of any product if they had it. Most times, you wouldn't find it. This was Chavez and Maduro's way of solving the problem. Now they sell the clap bag, which is not available all the time, and which products many times are expired. You need to have El Carnet de la Patria to buy it. The products in it are also very random, never the same, so you pay for it without even knowing what you are getting. For 20 years, Chávez, Maduro, Diosdado Cabello, Tarek El Isami, and those in the military and political parties, as well their families, have stolen the profits that come from oil, narco-trafficking, and illegally gold mining, destroying the rainforest. Their money has gone to bank accounts abroad. A few years ago, Panama Papers revealed some of their names. The nephew of the First Lady, Maduro's wife, was caught trafficking drugs and is being processed by international authorities. For all these reasons, the Venezuelan people asked for international intervention. Many militaries that have tried to rebel against Maduro have been killed, such as the case of Oscar Perez. The drama of Venezuela's political conflict is being carried out against the backdrop of its worst economic crisis in decades. Supermarket shelves are empty, making the daily priority the search for just the basics. 
News of a delivery triggers massive queues. The socialist government was responsible for the lack of diversification of industries and competition. This is what happens in countries with thoroughly centrally planned economies. The only reason China maintained and built more power is by going more capitalist with industries and greatly diversifying their goods and services to trade with the world. This is socialism, folks, and the future of America if we don't turn around. Welcome to economic slavery. The solution is to turn back to agriculture and provide agriculture land for everyone to grow their own food and cloth and salt or wood. The wealth of a country should be back up by real gold. Gold is the real money and not the paper fiat currency. Since ancient times gold is the standard of wealth. Communism philosophy works by spreading poverty equally to form a classless society and achieve equality. Hyperinflation is not a mysterious process. Instead of a government collecting taxes and limiting its spending to its revenues, it borrows a good deal of its budget from the central bank, which monetizes that government debt by turning it into money. The monetization causes hyperinflation. In some cases, central banks even dispense with the fiction that the government is offering anything of value in exchange for newly created money. Germany itself lived through hyperinflation, there must be many German economists who could explain the process. Monetization is simply a tax on private holders of the currency. The only difference between inflation in American and Venezuela is that America can export their toxic parasitic inflation upon the world with their globally socialized fiat currency. Venezuela has to deal with it domestically. We all saw what happened when the euro fire walled American inflation from being exported to their central banks the American economy went bankrupt. So what did Americans do? They used socialism to bail them out, and the Fed just printed up $27 trillion and bought up all that bad debt that sent commodity price through the roof taxing the rest of the world. So Americans with their parasitic petrodollar live off the backs of the rest of the world. If the American economy had the same sanctions and monetary isolation that was invoked upon Venezuela, they would be in worse shape. But they are allowed to have their parasitic Saudi-enabled petrodollar to continue, which makes them the biggest parasitic socialists on the planet. This was the Atlantis Report. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.